I, I'm so grateful that everybody's here with us. We have um, some bad storms coming through and there's some other sad things happening in our world. So we'll just try to be positive and uh, learn a little bit about what we can do to help our environment here in the United States. Uh, my name is Christine Curry and I am the Iowa Outreach Coordinator of the Isaac Walton League's Upper Mississippi River Initiative known as UMRI. And welcome to our 2022 series on soil and water conservation, thinking like a watershed program. The monthly presentations are jointly hosted with our Isaac Walton Lake colleagues of the Upper Mississippi River Initiative. Co-hosts include our Panera Conservation Chapter member, Chris Henning, and Des Moines Chapters Communication Director, Bud Hartley. Thank you for joining us this evening for another extraordinary presentation, the 2023 Farm Bill after 100 years of conservation, how the Isaac Walton League has influenced federal agriculture policy and what we can do for next year's Farm Bill with Dwayne Herboka, Agriculture Program Director of the Isaac Walton League of America. This evening, we will learn how the League played an instrumental role in groundbreaking environmental victories during the past 100 years. Duane will highlight some of those accomplishments, such as the creation of the Soil Bank in 1956, the Clean Water Act in 1972, and the Conservation Reserve Program in 1985, and the Conservation Stewardship Program in 2002. He will also summarize the 2023 Farm Bill um, suggestions he's heard during the winter listening sessions. It's not too late to add your own ideas as the league begins to shape its priorities for next year's legislative Farm Bill showdown. So welcome, Dwayne, and I'll let you take it away. And I believe Dwayne has a PowerPoint if all goes as planned. The storm might be um, making things a little cranky in our technology. So let's hope that everything goes as planned. Well, hi, everybody. It looks like a real great group. So I really appreciate all of you being here, spending time. Um, I'm here in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is the world headquarters of the Isaac Walton League of America. It's a beautiful sunny day here without a lot of wind. So um, I'm expecting that storm to head my way and get here just in time for this weekend to go camping in it. So that'll be something to look forward to. Uh, I'm gonna um, try this PowerPoint thing and we'll see how it works. And if it doesn't, I may just wing it, but um, here we go. All right, place there. And then if I click on this, Okay, so we're off. All right, so the 2023 Farm Bill is coming up. I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanna start though with a little bit of history of the Isaac Walton League of America. For those of you who are Isaac Walton League members, you may know some of this, but um, I also think a lot of people don't know the agriculture connection that the League has had for most of the century that we've been around. Um, 1922 was when the league was chartered in Chicago, Illinois, and it was a time when there were a lot of things going bad in America. And if you if you look back at that time, it was not long after they'd finished draining the Great Black Swamp. Um, the wildlife population numbers in those days at the turn of the century were really low. Most of the deer, the elk, wild turkeys. Um, a lot of those species had been hunted out, and so there were you know, very few of them left. It was really in the beginnings of the first uh, conservation, really wildlife conservation management and, and, and fish management. And actually, 1913, Pennsylvania was the first state to start licensing hunters so that they would restrict the number of, of animals you could take. So 1914, we lost the last passenger pigeon. Um, bison back then, we had less than 2,000 
bison. A few of them were in Yellowstone. The rest of them were scattered around. Um, things were pretty bleak. In 1918 was when they finished dredging the Kankakee River, which drained the Grand Marsh, about a million acres of really productive um, swamp land up there in Illinois and Indiana. So, so 1922, when the league was created, things looked pretty bleak in America. The rivers were largely, were almost all polluted. Um, anytime you had any kind of a city nearby, they were mostly, you know, dumping their sewage straight into the river. So it, the league was created in part by, mostly by anglers. It was fishermen who said, we're losing our wetlands, we're losing our fishing areas, we're losing our rivers, and darn it, it's time to, to put a stop to this. And that's what the league was created to do. If you look at the history of what some of the things that the league has done, um, it, was the, it was the league that started lobbying more than a decade before for a national water pollution law, which finally became the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. And then it was a couple decades later um, when that law proved not as effective as it should be. And the league was right there in the heart of creating the Clean Water Act of 1972. Dwayne, which, yeah. um, you're in presenter mode. Okay. Um, so I think if you switch your PowerPoint so that we don't see your other part of it. it oh, will... so you're seeing all that? Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. letting me know. Yeah, I knew, I knew that, but somebody pointed that out too. So I was just going to let you go on. Yeah, so. Um... Dwayne, you can just display settings up at the top there. There's a little drop down. And then you can swap presenter view and slideshow. Not How's that? Sure. There you go. Okay, so now you got it. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so the league uh, was instrumental in creating those clean water laws. It was also instrumental, people don't realize this, but years before um, Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson, the league in our, new, in our magazine was talking about the dangers of DDT. So really the league has been, I think, ahead of the curve on a lot of conservation um, over the last century. Let's talk specifically about agricultural policy, which really started in the United States with, um, in 1933 with the Farm Bill and in 1935 with the Soil Conservation Act of 1935. And I've been trying to find a little more history, but certainly the league was a cheerleader in trying to help um, policymakers understand the need to conserve soil on America's farms and ranches. In 1937, the League proposed to retire mountain meadows to use a program with federal funding to look at those meadows, which at the time were really being torn up. All that sediment was running into the rivers, all those trout streams were getting um, run over by sediment. And so this was an unsuccessful proposal, but it was one of the earlier league proposals with respect to public policy. In 1954, there was something called the Walton Soil Plan, which um, argued that we ought to take uh, some of the land that was then growing surplus crops, uh, set it aside um, and create a conservation reserve of that program of those lands where we would plant grasses and trees. And that in fact was the basis that became the 1956 Soil Bank, which was a federal program that did that and lasted into the 1960s. The concept came back in 1985. And 1985 was really the marks the, the first um, time when we had a conservation title right there in the farm bill in, in recent history. And it created the Conservation Reserve Program. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, it also created put in place Swamp Buster and Sod Buster. And those are two provisions that's, that is basically a pact between America's taxpayers and the farmers who collect um, and benefit from farm loans, from commodity programs, from crop insurance, from some of the other federal programs. And what it said was, if you are gonna take advantage of those programs, if you're gonna um, collect those commodity program payments, the, the crop insurance subsidies, um, those farm loans, then you have to do two things for us taxpayers. One was you have to refrain from draining or filling your swamps. So if you've got wetlands on your property, you gotta basically leave them alone. 
you can farm through them if you want, if that works or if it's a dry year, but you just can't drain them and you can't fill them. And then Sodbuster, which said, if you have highly erodible soil on your land, and that's about one in four cropland acres in the country is considered highly erodible. If you have that uh, highly erodible land on your, um, uh, in your operation, then you've got to have a soil conservation plan for it. Um, in 2002, the Isaac Walton League was, was right in the thick of the creation of a very innovative program, what was then called Conservation Security Program. It's now called the Conservation Stewardship Program. And the idea is instead of doing things practice by practice and field by field, we ought to take a whole farm approach to conservation solutions. So we ought to find a conservation plan for the whole farm altogether and that addressed multiple resources with conservation systems. So instead of one practice here and one practice there, we do the whole farm at once with a comprehensive conservation system. And that, that program is still doing that work today. And then um, in 2018, the 2018 Farm Bill, we were very focused by then already on soil health. And you can see dozens of soil health provisions in that 2018 Farm Bill. So certainly, over the past century, the league has been very active, well before my time, um, in doing agricultural policy work uh, with respect to the Farm Bill. So what are we doing today? If you look at the things that we're doing, we are very focused on soil health. And whether that's at the federal level or at the state level, or the work, the great work that's been done by the Upper Mississippi River Initiative at the Isaac Walton League, focused a lot on soil. And there's a really a reason for that. If you look at the numbers today, for farmers who are still practicing kind of conventional agriculture, and that means we're either tilling or plowing or disking the soil, so that's intensive tillage. Um, farmers traditionally have planted in the spring, harvested in the fall, and left the ground bare the rest of the year. Uh, the crop rotations historically have been either continuous, so planting corn every year, or maybe rotating corn and soybeans or um, cotton and soybeans. Um, and then heavy, fairly heavy use of chemical nitrogen and phosphorus um, in order to, uh, in part to make up for the loss of fertility that we saw because of all the tillage and some of the ways that the land has been managed. So what we had with that system is for about every, every ton of corn that you harvest off, off the cropland, you're losing about two tons of soil. So that's pretty stark when you think about it. And I've heard it described that in Iowa, the largest export, the largest agricultural export from Iowa isn't corn or soybeans, it's the soil that's leaving the land and running down the river um, and off down towards the Gulf of Mexico. And if you look at that 7.6 tons of soil erosion per acre, and you think about the soil organic matter, the carbon that's in that soil, it's several hundred pounds of carbon that we're losing out of the soil every year just because of that soil erosion. So that's why we're focused on the soil. That's one of the reasons. So what do we get when we start moving towards healthy soils? And healthy soils are really soils with life in them, soils with bacteria, soils with fungus, um, soils that are providing all the benefits that those bacteria and fungi provide for the plants. And um, that in turn provides benefits for the crops that we harvest off of them. But if you take the first steps towards conservation, um, of those lands towards soil health, it's conservation tillage. So reducing the tillage. Um, so we do a whole lot less of it. And there we get benefits. The phosphorus loss, the runoff of phosphorus um, declines. We can start to st store more carbon in the soil. Um, then if you look at um, planting a cover crop in the winter. So instead of leaving that soil bare all um, winter long, what we're gonna do is plant a cover crop in the fall or the late summer. And so we'll have something growing all year round. Those plants will then help feed the microbes and that helps feed the soil. So again, we reduce the nitrogen runoff, we reduce the phosphorus runoff, we build carbon in the soil. When you start to diversify crop rotations, 
when you do just some basic nutrient management, again, we're reducing nitrogen, reducing phosphorus runoff. So that's pretty important. And when we get to the next steps, when we get to um, going all the way to no-till, so no tillage at all, again, we, we reduce runoff to, to very small, to almost nothing. Um, you start building carbon in the soil even faster with a multi-species cover crop. Um, so you're combining different kinds of things, maybe some lagoons, maybe some tillage radishes um, with some of the other things that you plant as cover crops. You get additional benefits. When you start getting into three or four crops in your rotation, then you start adding more carbon to the soil. And when you start replacing more of that chemical fertilizer with manure by putting animals back on the land, putting livestock back on the land, again, we get more bonuses. So if you go from conventional to full soil health practices, what we get is we're almost eliminating the phosphorus runoff. We're sharply reducing the nitrogen runoff, and that's all good for water quality. We're storing a half a ton to a ton or more of carbon in the soil every year. It doesn't stay there permanently, but it gets cycled into the soil and it becomes part of the system there. Um, we can also do things like reduce the um, pesticide uh, load. We can reduce the, um, you know, both nitrogen and, and or fertilizer and pesticide use reduce by half or more. So it's exciting for a farmer who can reduce the inputs on their land and all those input costs. It's also exciting for us conservationists because of all the benefits that that provides. So you, you put it all together and you know, here's the bottom line uh, that I just described. You get lots of reductions in um, nutrient uh, runoff of nitrogen and fertilizer. Uh, you're building soil carbon, you're reducing those chemical inputs. So that's why we focus so much on soil health. So let me give you a quick um, version of, of sort of a Farm Bill 101, because the Farm Bill really is the federal policy where all this comes together. The federal, the Farm Bill really drives a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions on the farm. And it's one of the best tools we have if we're trying to transform American agriculture and move down towards a soil health model. The Farm Bill, was originated back in the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Um, we had some fairly poor land management then. We just tilled up a whole bunch of millions and millions of acres of prairie on the Great Plains. And because um, of those practices and because of the drought we encountered, all that soil was starting to blow and it started to blow east. And in fact, what got us some of the conservation um, legislation policy we had was in the 1930s was that soil was blown as far east as Washington DC and New York City and out into the Atlantic Ocean. And that really brought home to policymakers in DC uh, the problems that we had. So the first farm bill was actually three different bills. It was the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, um, which raised crop prices and put in place a subsidy that encouraged farmers to, to not grow crops, to not grow the surplus crops. Um, it also created the Soil Conservation Service and their job was to go educate farmers about better conservation practices. But the, the bill also provided subsidies for farmers to plant native grasses and trees and also to raise vegetables instead of commodity crops. And that helped increase the food supply for Americans. It also helped keep food um, costs low because at the time uh, during the Great Depression when you had 20 or 25 percent unemployment, you had a whole lot of people who couldn't afford food. Um, and so we were trying to keep it affordable for folks. And then the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936, which basically was passed um, to get around a Supreme Court decision um, that said the first farm bill they passed was unconstitutional. But the, the farm bill, the very first farm bill focused on three things. It focused on feeding Americans, making sure people had access to uh, low cost, affordable food. It um, focused on helping farmers stay in business by ensuring that they were going to get enough money from the crops they raised to, to have parity, to basically to be able to pay for um, the cost of growing it. 
And it focused on conservation and making sure that we were taking care of that land and helping farmers take care of that land that we needed to grow those crops. So since then, we've had a farm bill about every five years. The latest farm bill, the 2018 farm bill, provided about $85 billion a year for these agricultural programs. And I'll show you how that breaks out. The next one's coming up next year. So that's why it's a very exciting time to be here talking about this stuff. As I said, those policies and programs really drive a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions on farms and ranches. So this is the big pie. About three quarters of the farm bill spending goes for food programs. So things that we call food stamps, but also other kinds of nutrition programs. It's about where three quarters of that $85 billion a year goes for. Um, if you look at the other things, a, a big chunk of it goes for um, commodity programs. That's the uh, yellow slice there. The red slice is for crop insurance. And then the blue slice is for conservation. And that's about $6 billion a year. Um, so it's the fourth biggest slice of the pie. There's a, and then everything else, all the rural development, everything else is in that other little slice of the pie. What I'm gonna focus on really is mostly that blue slice to talk about the conservation programs that come out of that farm bill. So they come in different flavors. There are programs that are designed to set aside marginal land um, and to put it into conservation use. The Conservation Reserve Program does that with shorter term contracts, with 10 or 15 year contracts. The Agriculture Conservation Easement Program does that with permanent easements. And so it sets aside things like wetlands and helps us restore wetlands and grasslands, and then provides a permanent conservation easement on it so they will always remain in that conservation use. So the things we get out of this program are things like buffer strips along streams, we get grasslands that are restored, we get windbreaks planted, we have woodlands that are restored. We also get that permanent protection for some of those key native prairies that we have, for some of the key wetlands that we've restored, um, and even for some of the farmland that's in around urban areas where it's critical to growing food. We also have what we call working lands programs, and those are designed to deal with farmers, to help farmers and ranchers be better stewards on those working lands that remain in production. So they help us by providing a, a share of the cost to farmers for putting practices in place, for maintaining those practices, and for also putting in place conservation systems. And where we get for things like that are, we get to reduce the tillage that farmers do, we help them plant cover crops, we help them move into more diverse crop rotations, we help them do those basic nutrient management things. Um, and so those kinds of systems, uh, we also do conservation systems, things like integrated pest management to help reduce overall pesticide use. We also put in place structures like terraces um, on um, sloped hillsides. And we even do some things like building hog lagoons for those large confinement systems. So all of that comes through these working lands programs. And there's a third one called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is basically a catch-all. It's designed to use all of those other four conservation programs, um, but target them in specific watersheds or specific areas, and to also leverage state and local funding. So that's basically a partnership program with state, local, and nonprofit organizations and agencies where they all come together and say, we have a specific problem in this watershed. Here is a short list of practices and, um, and programs that will help us deal with that. And it may be practices um, like cropland practices. It may be grazing management. It may be putting terraces in. Um, so they decide on what the short list is, and then they focus those in a particular area uh, so that we hopefully deliver the conservation um, in that was needed in that particular area. And then there's a third bucket, and that's basically for conservation planning and education. In the USDA budget, we call it conservation technical assistance. It's about 760 million, which goes for to hire those USDA employees who will go around and talk to farmers to do conservation plans for those farmers who help do education and outreach. And that money also pays for some other 
cooperative partners for the people like Ducks Unlimited and Pheasants Forever and the Wild Turkey Federation who have farm bill biologists in different states who are doing something similar to USD employees. They're actually meeting directly with farmers, helping them plant conservation systems on their farms. So that's what that six billion goes for. It's all pretty critically important um, programs uh, when we start talking about uh, conservation on our landscape. There's a couple other things, and I kind of talked about these before, that are in the Farm Bill today. Swamp Buster, again, um, says those farmers who accept Farm Bill benefits can't drain or fill those wetlands to farm the land. Sod Buster, which says farmers who accept those Farm Bill benefits have to have a soil conservation plan for that highly erodible soil that they have, if they have any in their operation. And then something relatively new called Sod Saver. And what that's designed to do is to protect native prairie. So it's focused right now on farmers in the prairie pothole states up in the northern uh, Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, um, pieces of Nebraska, and what it's uh, and Montana. And what it says is that farmers who tear up that native prairie will get their crop insurance subsidies reduced for several years um, so that us taxpayers aren't paying incentives for farmers to tear up native prairie. One of the things we'd like to see is that provision expanded nationwide because there's grasslands every, all up and down the Great Plains. California and Washington and Oregon have grasslands. Florida has grasslands. There are grasslands all over the country that really deserve protection from that provision. So one of the things, one of the other pieces of the Farm Bill, and I'll just touch on this, is our crop insurance. Um, taxpayers, that's all of you, pay about 60% of the cost of the premiums that farmers pay to insure their crops. So it's a pretty big subsidy. It's designed to get farmers to participate in the program so that when there's, um, when there's a drought, when there's a flood, when there are other natural systems that create crop lo a loss in yield, um, but also when crop prices fall between planting and harvest, farmers are insured, so a share of that loss um, is covered by this crop insurance. And one of the things crop insurance does on the positive side is it certainly helps farmers mitigate their risk. One of the things it does on the negative side is it makes it um, easier for farmers to think about farming like so those bottomlands along the creek that may flood out on a regular basis. If they've got subsidized crop insurance that can cover at least a big share of those losses, then they're um, more prone to, to planting along those acres rather than putting them in buffer strips or, or leaving them alone. We have the same thing out on the Great Plains. A lot of native prairie is being torn up in part because you know, during those wet and dry periods, and especially the dry period you get on the Great Plains, um, they'll get a share of their loss. If it's a bad year, you know, they'll get a share of loss covered by crop insurance which taxpayers are paying a big chunk for. So that's one of the downsides of crop insurance. So let me turn to the Isaac Walton League. Now, first, what we heard when we did some listening sessions, and then our agenda, the things that we're thinking about. So we held listening sessions in Iowa and Minnesota, in Illinois. Um, we may do another one or two we're still planning to do one just with Isaac Walton League members, which will be a virtual session. And we did a virtual session with a bunch of landowners who mostly own land in Minnesota and Iowa, um, but they're spread out all over the country. So we did a special session with them that was virtual. So we had a whole lot of a good participation. People spent easily two hours telling us what was right and what was wrong with current USDA programs and with Farm Bill and how we could fix them. And it was some great input. So here's the things we heard. One thing we heard is there's just not enough money. That too many farmers get turned down for when they apply for conservation programs, typically more than half um, don't get those um, those things. And so in some of these bigger programs, we're turning away two thirds of the farmers who apply. There's also not enough money for NRCS staff 
and for local conservation districts who are out there trying to educate and help farmers with things like soil health and conservation programs. There's just not enough money. We also heard about crop insurance and we heard, because we were mostly talking to conservationists, hunters, anglers, canoers, hikers, um, outdoor enthusiasts. We also had a lot of sustainable farmers and organic farmers that were part of our sessions. So it was a real mix of people who all, I think, shared a commitment to the land. But they recognized that crop insurance has a downside, um, that the systems don't reward the farmers who use soil health practices, because when they, when they do that, that reduces their risk of a crop loss. If you've got good soil health, uh, you're not going to be in bad a shape as your neighbor is when there's a drought or when there's a flood. But those farmers pay just as much as everybody else does for their crop insurance. So what are we thinking about there in terms of those first two? First, with not enough money, we've proposed that we double up funding for conservation programs. And that could happen in the next farm bill. It might just happen in, it was proposed to happen um, in the Build Back Better, um, the big package that didn't make it through Congress. Um, but basically, However we get it, we, that would provide about $6 billion more dollars per year for those conservation programs and, and for NRCS and other employees to help farmers. With respect to the crop insurance woes, what we proposed is a premium discount for soil health practices. So the farmers who put in place, who grow cover crops, who reduce their tillage, who diversify their crop rotations, who put in place rotational grazing systems, they would get see some benefit from those by having a discount on their crop insurance premium. We also heard farmland owners are frustrated. These are people who own farmland, but they rent it out to somebody else to farm. Um, that's about half of the cropland in the country is owned by somebody who doesn't farm it. They tell us that they, they get ignored when they go into USDA offices because they're not farmers, they get ignored. They're often not even told what the conservation dollars are buying on their land when farmers are changing systems. Um, their cooperation is really critical. Health, soil health isn't a one-time practice. It's not a one-time fix. It's a continuing thing. And so in order to do that, you need landowners that are on board that are willing to ride with farmers as they implement those practices year after year. We also heard from consumers that consumers and farmers need better meat options. Consumers want to buy grass finished or organic or pasture raised or local. They want to buy the stuff that really has higher health values for them and often better economic values. That's what they want to buy, but to deliver that, farmers and ranchers need more local meat processing facilities so they don't have to haul their cows a couple hundred miles in order to find a small local facilities. So what can we do about that? Well, Farmland owners are frustrated. Certainly more outreach and education to farmland owners would help us. Um, and involving farmland owners more in the programs and in the decisions, that would be another way that um, we could help bring farmland owners into the equation and help them be a positive influence in terms of driving us towards soil health future. And consumers and farmers need options. The Biden administration this year released I think about a billion dollars in order to expand and grow those local meat processing options to try to put more of these in more communities so that there'd be more options. That's something that we can really build on. Uh, we've lost a lot of those little local meat plants over the years and we continue to lose them. And so we need to find ways to really expand those options for farmers and for the consumers that want that, that, that demand those kinds of products. In our listening sessions, we also heard that we need to spread the load, that USDA does good things, but they don't, they, they don't have enough expertise, especially in soil health within the agency um, and broadly through the agency. They don't have enough employees who are able to get outside the office. Most USDA conservation employees are, are, are stuck in the office taking applications and processing applications from farmers and they really don't have a chance to go out onto farms. And so we need, um, we need to spread the load beyond just USDA. They can't, we can't rely, we can't ask USDA to do everything. 
and we need stronger standards. People told us that um, USDA often looks the other way when farmers violate Swamp Buster and start draining or filling wetlands on their property. USDA's soil conservation standards are, are allow 10 times as much erosion as can be naturally replenished. Um, and that's supposed to be sod buster. So sod buster there really doesn't have much in the way of teeth at times. So we saw some frustrations there from conservationists. So how do we deal with those? Well, spreading the load, one thing we've suggested is a state and tribal soil health grant program, which provide federal funds to help states develop and implement soil health strategies. We think it would put states in the lead in terms of um, delivering soil health and help them support those uh, local conservation districts that can do the same thing. With respect to stronger standards, there's different ways to handle that. You could separate USDA enforcement office. So the NRCS employees who are supposed to be helping farmers don't have to be the ones out there uh, enforcing and being the police. It's hard to be a good cop and a bad cop at the same time. So let's not ask them to do that. Uh, we could use some of the new technology and some of the new things that are out there to help identify wetlands better so that they're based on good science and good technology. We could modernize the soil erosion standards to recognize the need to conserve our soil better. So what's the answer? Um, and that's part of the dilemma. That's part of the question. Is it just a question of adding more money, of asking, telling farmers, you know, we'll pay you to do these conservation practices? Um, we think some more money is helpful, certainly to help farmers um, make the transformation from current intensive tillage, from current conventional agriculture um, in, into really a soil health focused agriculture. And this outreach is going to be critical. We need a lot more outreach and education. What about regulations? That's one of the things we heard as we went through this is people, at least some of the people at every session were saying, you know, we've been trying this voluntary incentive-based conservation for several decades. We still don't have swimmable and fishable waters. We're still losing carbon out of the soil. So agriculture is not yet neutral with respect to um, greenhouse gases. Um, so, hey, is it time now we just regulate farmers like we do every other industry in America? We heard that a lot in our sessions. And I think that's a question for Isaac Walton League members to grapple with, because that would take a change, uh, would take a resolution, um, a policy resolution, and a discussion within the organization. And that's not my decision. That's really a decision for our members. Um, but certainly, we think we need to do the things that we talked about, doubling down on funding, um, trying to put more tools in the hands of farmers, and also in the hands of the agencies that will help them. So we think we've got a good program that will move us forward. But I guess I'd also warn people if we don't, if we fail to do those things, if we continue in business as usual, we're gonna to continue to get similar results, which is slow progress towards goals that where we really have an urgency to act when it comes to water quality, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to wildlife. So what can we do? Well, we can all help build a better farm bill. And so let me close with that. Here's some of the things that you can do, and I'm sure we'll be communicating more over the next year. Um, one thing, we have a farm bill suggestion box. So we heard a lot from a lot of people. We want to hear more. So if you have, especially if you have good ideas, whether it's a little program tweak or whether it's a big idea, we want to hear them. We've got on our website, www.iwla.org. We now have a farm bill suggestion box. We're inviting people to come there and tell us what we should be thinking about. You can sign up for our Soil Matters email and you can, from that same website, um, if you get to the um, soil conservation section, we've got an email that we put out about twice a month. We try to update people on what's going on in Washington, DC and around the country with respect to these priorities. Um, you can respond to action alerts when we send them. The thing that every member of Congress does is they listen to their constituents and they listen pretty closely and they need to hear from you. They need to hear from all of us about how important these priorities are for us. You can help spread the word, talk to your neighbors, talk to friends, forward our emails around, post them on social media, spread the word about soil health. It's something that I think 
uh, more and more farmers are paying attention to, a lot of them still are still don't know an awful lot about soil health, but they're paying attention. They've heard the term, they're paying attention. Many more of us need to know about soil health because it isn't just about farms. It also applies in your backyard and in your garden. And finally, um, we can, you can help us with innovative ways to help bring the soil message to members of Congress. And it may be a farm tour, it may be a soil health briefing, um, it may be doing a meeting with your member of Congress or with your state legislator. There's a lot of different ways you can get involved. And um, we're looking for people who are interested in doing that over the next year. So let me close. This is my contact information. Um, be glad to have you, you know, email me or call me. Emily Rodriguez is our agriculture outreach coordinator. She's in Champaign, Illinois. So she's out in the middle of the country. That and you're welcome to contact her, especially if you're in Indiana, Illinois, or Iowa is her main stomping grounds. And I put Dave Zentner's information up here. I hope you doesn't mind, Dave, the Upper Mississippi River Initiative Director. Um, and UMRI is doing a lot of really neat stuff on the ground to do outreach to farmers and outreach to landowners and to really spread the word about soil health and about conservation systems and benefits to folks in that upper Mississippi region, which is Mississippi, or sorry, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. So there's our contact information. I'll end with that. We can probably put that screen up back later, but let me stop sharing and then um, open this up for questions or comments. Okay. Thank and you so back. much, uh, Dwayne. That was fantastic. Really good information. And we have, uh, just to let you know, we have a couple people that joined in a little bit later uh, after we first uh, were introducing you. So um, welcome to those who came on after our initial introduction. And we have Bud Hartley, who is live streaming from the Isaac Walton League's Des Moines Chapter House. And uh, do you still have some people around or did they all mosey off to the bar? Uh, we've still got a few here. Oh, fantastic, that's great. Okay, so we do have, um, and I wanted to acknowledge that we have a Democrat uh, candidate who is running for Senator, Michael Franken is with us too, pretty exciting. Um, and I, I put a bunch of, uh, uh, links to our presentation this uh, evening on Facebook pages and uh, his was one of them and I said boy it'd be great if uh, Michael could join us and he said I will try I will come in <laughs> so thank you Michael for joining us uh, very very pleased Pete Buttigieg was right when you talk about farming talk about soil yeah fantastic so we have a couple of uh, questions I think uh, Chris are you able to uh, are you able I am, to? See? I am. Okay. Uh, Jill Crafton asked earlier if uh, Swamp Buster and Sod Buster were actually fully funded in uh, 1985. And then Carolyn would like you to explain the initials NSAC in such a way that uh, we'd, because it was so important that we would have that. And I'll check for others while you handle those two, okay? Great. So Sodbuster and Swampbuster were not actually, were provisions that require farmers to do things. So they required farmers to refrain from um, draining or filling um, wetlands, and they required farmers to have a soil conservation plan. Over the next few years after 1985, the USDA worked with farmers to develop all those conservation plans. So we didn't just throw them out on their own. They did actually go through, worked with farmers to develop conservation plans, soil conservation plans for that highly erodible soil. Since that time, um, USDA has just, in terms of enforcing those, there really hasn't been a specific, a specific line item budget in the USDA budget for enforcing Swamp Buster and Sod Buster. And what happens is that when a USDA employee sees what they think is a violation, they see somebody out there draining of a wetland um, in their field, they're supposed to report it 
to their superiors and then somebody's supposed to go out and check it. What we've heard, especially recently, is that employees are not encouraged to do that. And in some offices, they're discouraged from doing that. Um, but um, so that's one of the challenges is with the enforcement. There's really nobody at USDA charged specifically with just doing that. Um, they sort of leave it to everybody and they leave it to individuals to say, if you see your neighbor, then you're supposed to rat your neighbor out. You're supposed to report them to USDA. The downside of that is if you do that, you'll never hear back from USDA because it's all private. It's all secret. So whatever happened, you will never know it um, because that's private between USDA and the farmer. So it's not the optimal way of, of doing that, but I hope I answered that question. Um, so NSAC, as we call it, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition is a nationwide organization of about 130 organizations. So it's a, it's a nationwide coalition. So NSAC, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, coalition of about 130 um, organizations around the country. The Isaac Walton League is a member, as are a number of other sustainable and organic farming organizations, um, some food organizations, some farm worker organizations, some other conservation organizations like ours. So I know we've got folks in, um, so Nebraska, the um, Nebraska Sustainable Agriculture Society, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Illinois Stewardship Alliance, um, Michael Fields Agriculture Institute, Land Stewardship Project. Um, if you're familiar with any of those organizations, they all are part of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And it's where especially a lot of state-based organizations come together to develop and press for federal agricultural policy that's going to help move us toward in the direction of more sustainable farming systems. They do great work. We're a member. Um, hope that answered that question. So what else you got? Okay, I got a couple more and um, but I couldn't do both at the same time, like unmute myself and look at it. So now I can read it. Uh, Mike Delaney uh, wants to know if we know why the Farm Bill of 1933 was found unconstitutional. And I don't know if that affects us in these days, but what happened that they thought it was unconstitutional? And then I've got another one about livestock, but we'll talk about the uh, 1933 Farm Bill. You know, I don't know the answer to that. And I try not to guess when I don't know. Okay. Well, that's a good enough answer. Um, my question uh, as a follow-up is, uh, you know, that's 90 years ago. Does it make any difference today anyway? So, and it might, it might be something that we should know about anyway. Um, We'll put that one on the back burner mic for now, and we'll ask Carolyn's question. Could you talk about the need for local processing plants for livestock and managed livestock as a, a soil health tool? And then for my benefit, <laughs> I'm going to tag on Carolyn's question. Um, there's a whole lot of talk about small butcher shops, so small slaughtering houses in um, small town Iowa. And it's happening right here in the town that I live in. And there were actually no regulations that keep them from being on Main Street even. And I'm wondering if we don't have the cart before the horse or the cart before the cow or the steer, as it might be, um, that it, this is an ag processing deal and it really doesn't belong in downtown Jefferson, in my opinion. But they've gotten the okay from the city to do it because there's no way to stop it. Um, so if you want to talk about that and then maybe leave my part till the 
you don't even have to, I just was editorializing that it seems to me that we are backwards in how we're doing that. But go ahead. I sure understand that. So, so yes, people want people want these different kinds of, they want pasture-aid poultry. And if you've eaten it, you'll know why. It's not the same as a bird that's been raised in a in a, in a barn with forty thousand other chickens. Um, it just tastes different. It's a different animal. Um, they want grass finished meat and dairy and eggs because they have higher um, nutrients in terms of things that will help people. So people want those in part for their health and in part because they're they're better for the land, better for the environment. What we have right now is that four giant meat processing companies um, process like 90% of the cattle. I think it's 80, 85% of the cattle in the country. Um, and, and you can't just take your cow to the processing plant and get your cow out the back end. It's a factory. It goes in one end. What comes out the other end is somebody else's cow. Um, so people want to People want that. And so we've been losing those meat processing plants around the country because it's hard for them to compete. But um, as consumer demand grows, and it is, uh, we think there's much more need for that. And so both from the consumer's point of view and from the farmer's point of view, trying to um, rebuild, to expand, to site those local processing plants in more places around the country and um, and, and train the people that we need in order to operate them is one way of meeting that consumer demand. The link to soil health is that what we're learning now is that putting livestock on the land is one more piece of the puzzle when we're trying to build soil health. So if all you're doing is growing crops, even if you're growing cover crops, even if you're doing everything that you can to promote good soil health, if you don't have cattle back on the land or sheep back on the land, if you don't have animals and manure, if you're not cycling those nutrients onto that soil, if you're not beefing up the bacteria and the fungi um, and the carbon that they live on, then you're not, you're not restoring soil health as fast as you could. So putting livestock back on the land is one thing that we're finding is really important to help drive soil health. In order to do that, um, then these local processing facilities will help us because farmers will be able to take advantage of the things that they're doing and they'll have climate friendly beef, um, for instance. Uh, so there, there are a lot of alternatives and a lot of options. And so helping farmers put that livestock back on the land, whether it's their livestock or whether it's their neighbor's livestock, that they put back on their cropland. So they, you know, maybe they don't want to deal with livestock. Uh, but if it's somebody else's livestock, it can still benefit their land. But that usually means fencing and it means providing water. So that's sort of the tie between those meat processing plants and the soil health that we really need to do. With respect to where you put these, and if they don't belong on Main Street, I can certainly understand that view. That's really a local zoning question. So if your local town or village or county thinks that's not something you really should have right front and center as people drive down Main Street, then hopefully, um, you know, sometimes just talking to people and convincing them doesn't convince them to do, to, wouldn't convince them to move it, but, you know, probably some local zoning issues there if that would address that need. Um. That's possible, but it's like the cart before the horse, kind of like we had uh, hog confinements before we had a matrix and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, there, was, there wasn't any zoning and the city wanted the $25,000 for the lot. So they sold it to a slaughterhouse. That's one block off of Main Street. So that's, you know, and it'll be there. It'll be there. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for <laughs> and buy my pork and my beef and from local producers who already are having theirs uh, done at um, boutique slaughterhouses for lack of a better term. Um, 
locally owned sl slaughterhouses at Arcadia um, at State Center where Tom Rosberg has his pork done and that kind of thing. So anyway, just the, um, the USDA got all excited about winemaking and grapes in 2001 and we had a whole lot of wineries and now we're going to have a whole lot of slaughterhouses is my opinion. Okay, um, are there USDA inspections of smaller processing plants um, asking, Jill Crafton is asking, and is there any thing in the farm bill that uh, allows ranchers to use easements for grazing as their lands are recovering from grazing on their own land? So let me start with the second one. Um, yes, there are programs like the Conservation Reserve Program Grasslands contract, which would allow a, a grassland owner, so a rancher, to put their land in the program to put in place a conservation plan for that land. Um, and then it would provide at least a 10 or 15 year contract that would maintain that land in grass, but would also allow them to, to get a little bit of money to help recognize that maybe what their land needed was rest and part of it. And so to put in place better grazing management. The easement programs at USDA, so the, the grassland and farmland easement programs also can incorporate a like a conservation plan. So a farmer putting a native prairie into a, a egg conservation easement program, a federal easement, um, which could be held by say a, a land trust um, they, could, they could then have a conservation plan on that. And so part of the money that went to the, to the landowner could help them um, put in place better grazing management, maybe build fences, put in water facilities so they could move the animals around. So yes, I think the answer is yes, there are some things right now in the farm build conservation programs that allow people to do that. On um, terms of the meat packing stuff, there are there are USDA inspected facilities. And if you take your meat, take your animal to those facilities, you can sell them anywhere. You can sell them to grocery stores, across state lines, restaurants, anybody, you can sell them if they're USDA inspected. Small meat parsing plants can get a USDA inspection. It's kind of a cumbersome thing right now because they're really designed for, you know, the really giant processing plants that have you know, hundreds of employees and, and do a, you know, a whole lot of animals. Um, so it's cumbersome for a small plant to get USDA inspection, but some of them do, some of them can do that. There are also in some states, a, a state inspected um, program, which, a lot, which is supposed to be the equivalent of federal inspection. So it's the state equivalent of federal meat inspection. And if you take your animal there, you can then sell it within the state. So you could sell it to restaurants, you could sell it to um, grocery stores, individuals within the state. If you, um, if you wanna buy it, you can buy your meat directly from the farmer and you can then, you know, they can take the cow or the pig to the local meat processing plant and they don't have to be USD inspected as long as it's just going to you and as long as you're eating it or your family's eating it, it's where you try to sell that meat to somebody else, retail, that's when the inspection, that's when you need inspection to come in and make sure that you know down the line, whoever buys it is getting something that's safe and inspected. Right, I think in Iowa that to sell retail wrapped meat, you need the, license, the USDA license the farmer's market license um, allows you to sell out of your own freezer, uh, but they also have to have it USDA because the local lockers that aren't USDA um, can do what you said. They can process for the guy who brings in a beef and 
um, and his customer pays for the processing, they can process for that customer. Right. And a lot of those processing plants, I mean, when you think about all the hunters in the Isaac Wall League, a lot of those processing right. plants are the same people who do deer. Exactly. And so having the capacity there to do deer and, you know, and beef and pigs and chickens and whatever is really, um, it's, it's really helpful to have to the local economy to be able to have somebody who can raise maybe, you know, a couple thousand chickens for the local market and supplement their farm income and have a place locally they can take it and get them processed um, and hand it off to, or sold to consumers. It must be very difficult to do chickens at the same place you do pigs and cattle because there are only two licensed, USDA licensed um, to do poultry in Iowa. And I know that there are more, many more who do um, beef and, and deer, the, the larger mammals instead of poultry, so. Yeah, and those tend to be, the, the poultry ones tend to be fairly specialized. And I guess because of all the feathers and you just, you're dealing with a different animal, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> exactly. We're, um, we're out of questions in the chat, but do you have anything else that has come up that you might want to uh, give us or anybody else have any last minute questions? Car Caroline has an announcement for um, everybody that's still on. And then if anybody else, if Dwayne, if you still have a few more minutes, um, let us know and um, we'll be respectful of your time because I know you've had a, a 24 seven um, day. <laughs> so I'm glad to hang around. I won't be offended if you, if you need to leave. So take off if you need to. I know people's time is important. I'm glad to hang around for a few minutes if you've got questions or suggestions, I'm glad to do that. How, how about I jump in then for just a moment, Dwayne, and, and that way uh, we can take advantage of a, your captive audience. Um, uh, we just wanted to make sure that folks know that our next Thinking Like a Watershed program will be uh, back to the first Tuesday of May, it's May 3rd, and we're going to bring you a story of the change that can happen when you combine um, citizen scientists and the um, unfortunate discovery of human feces in county waterways and really solid data and a willing, albeit slow, but willing county board of commissioners. So this is gonna be some people out of, primarily out of Austin, Minnesota, uh, west of where I am right now and their um, efforts ongoing yet to make changes to their county septic system because of 100% um, detection of human feces in their DNA samples a couple of years ago. So that's going to be our program on May 3rd at 7 p.m. here central. And uh, Christine and the rest of us will get out flyers and the registration information uh, sooner than later. And if you get impatient or you're not on the right email listserv, you can find any of us, including Dwayne, who's one of us, even though he lives on the East Coast. All <laughs> right. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now. Dwayne, you can have it back again. Thank you, Caroline. That's a really exciting story. And it's a great demonstration of how to marriage policy with, um, with science and, and understand the, pro the, the real problem so that you can fix the problem. And I think it's it's a great story. So I really encourage you all to tune in for that one. Does anybody else have any questions for Dwayne or any inputs or? Dwayne, this is uh, Christine Dave Zettner up in the Oh, loop. great to see you, Z, uh, yeah. also known as Z. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Christine. We talk about the dynamics, Dwayne, between uh, local availability. <clears throat> Uh, produce, animal food, whatever it is. Um, and we look at where we've gone as a nation since the 1980s, and we began to talk so much about globalization. And we find so much market consolidation reflected on so many product areas. 
So it seems to me that the people that are willing to support organic, to support the local entrepreneur, pay more. Do you think the people that indicate in your listening session that they want more of that, I use the word fidelity, will have fidelity to value versus cost cutter, excuse me, Costco and Walmart and Sam's Club and pricing. Do you think there's any kind of a mini revolution that will put quality and local support at the forefront? Sorry for the long-winded question. Yeah, I think so. And that's one of the things that gives me hope that, you know, we need we need a pull in order to pull farmers towards um, these sustainable methods towards soil health. And I mean, I do see it because I see um, people, you know, when I buy a chicken from the local, um, the local farmer um, at the farmer's market, and it tastes completely different than the stuff I would buy in the grocery store. Um, I share that with friends and I explain to them where I got it and why it tastes different. And, and I think there's a lot more, you know, call them foodies if you want. There's a whole lot of people who don't think of themselves as foodies, but who really appreciate quality, who appreciate health. And I think we're learning more and more and more about the nutritional value of our food and about how much that nutritional value goes right back to the soil that it was grown in. And so as, as we're learning those things and people are <clears throat> internalizing those and understanding them, they're saying, well, I need to get me some of that. And so they're out looking for these kinds of, you know, for, for food that's been grown in particular ways. So I think both from a health standpoint, you know, even from a local economy standpoint and just from a taste and quality standpoint, I think people are really looking for more and more of those options. And so I'm hopeful that that will help us pull, pull farmers, pull the industry um, in that direction. One quicker question. In our UMRI, Alpha Mississippi River Initiative work, it is common to hear concerns from small producers, medium-sized producers, that the farm bill does not equitably serve them, that the great majority of it goes to these large consolidations, and there's a sense there of injustice to the, to the highly motivated small medium producers. What needs to be, what need, is, do you agree with that and what needs to happen? I, I do agree with it. I think that's true that um, the Department of Agriculture is, in the last several decades, I think had focused more and more on the big farms and the big producers and catered toward you know, a short list of the commodity crops. And um, I think we've seen some pushback against that. And I think, I think people, some people in the agency in, at USDA are, are understanding that there are people out there who are farmers, they're growing food, and they maybe only have an acre or five acres or 10 acres, but they're producing a whole bunch of food that is enough to feed a whole lot of people and that they deserve attention too. Um, just as much as somebody who's growing soybeans on a couple thousand acres. So I think we're seeing more of that. I'd say we've got a long ways to go um, in terms of getting more of the, getting the, making the programs work better for farmers of every size, um, work better for farmers of every color, because certainly we've seen discrimination in the past at USDA and you have you know, black farmers who won't go into a USDA office because of the way they were treated 10 years ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. Um, so we're missing out a lot of people. I think, I think justice is a good word to use for it. I think, so I think we got a lot we can do. Thank you. Brian, I had a question. And yes. So I noticed Mark's on from Minnesota Soil Health Coalition and um, 
those farmers are doing an amazing job of mentoring other farmers, but they seem to be, I don't know how that works for the USDA. So I was wondering, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Or is there anything we could be doing to increase support for the work that people like Grant and Don Brightbrights are doing? I don't know if he's unmuted or if he's available, but. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jill. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, just a little background on the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. It's a farmer-led, farmer-run organization. Uh, we operate a farmer mentor network because we focus on farmer-to-farmer -farmer education. And I think that's really the key. And we're definitely always looking to try to steer USDA to move that direction with some more of their technical support. A lot of challenges can take place when a farmer is transitioning from a conventional system to a health, soil health system. There's equipment modification issues. There's chemical residue issues. There's a lot of timing issues. Um, all you know, weed management. A lot of things change in how they have to manage their operation. And there's nothing better than when a farmer can be in a network of other farmers who've already experienced it to share their information with them. So I think that's a that's an important aspect that we always in, encourage USDA to try to you know focus their uh, technical guidance more in that direction. Thank you. Because it seems like USDA. I mean, what you've been describing, Dwayne, is is a an emphasis on a soil health plan and not on the mentoring that would really help facilitate, like Mark just described. Yeah, and I think that's true. That and and thanks, Mark and Jill, for the discussion. I think what US the model USDA is used to is kind of a one-on-one -on -one communication with a farmer. And I think what they're not as good at and as comfortable with is networks of farmers. And there are groups like Practical Farmers of Iowa who who built their organization on building networks of farmers talking to each other, experimenting, sharing the results of their experiments. Um, and, and there's other organizations like that. And I think everything that I hear tells me that's how farmers learn the best is not having one agency person, uh, you know, hand them answers. It's networking with farmers and building a system where people are mentoring each other and sharing their experiences, sharing what works and what doesn't work. And I think as we think about what, how we need to move forward in the future, I think finding ways to, to build those networks, to build those opportunities for farmers to engage in that um, and to have other farmers who are trying the same things they're, they're trying or trying different things. I think all of that's really important and we, we can't lose sight of how much of this isn't just about, you know, a cost share payment for doing a practice. It's really about understanding what the why the practice is there and why we're doing it and what's the best way to do it and how is it going to work on, on my farm, on my soils, in my farming system, in my county. So I think it's really critical that we not lose sight of that. So uh, I wanted to thank um, Duane for recognizing PFI. I'm a member and I see Maggie Norton is here. And uh, I wanna also say that the UMRI and the Ikes are each involved in networking with farmers too. And that as a farmer, I really appreciate that kind of outreach. And I really appreciate this kind of uh, conversation. And I'm going to have to take off because uh, I've got Kitty sitting outside out at my <laughs> farm, and I got to get them inside before they get blown away. So I'll see you all next time, and uh, I'll leave it to Christine to do her wrap up. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your contributions, Chris. You're amazing. Christine, I think that Mark had one more comment he wanted to make. But... Yeah, chime in, Mark. Oh, thank you. I, I was just going to note that um, that can be 
really important in terms of making sure that the farmers are successful with those practices and continue to do them in the long run because at the end of the day they're a business and they have to make money so you know that's always going to drive the, the decisions and they have to be able to implement soil health practices and be profitable in order for it to work and so i think we want to make sure that we you know, put them off on these practices with the with the right foot give them the tools they need so that they're successful because if they have a bad taste in their mouth about it or they lost money that's always going to hang over their head in these kind of conversations and decisions going forward that is so true we got to help farmers be successful in these practices not just in delivering and implementing the practices but in on the financial side of making this stuff um, pay off so that they're so they'll continue to do them Christine, you're on mute. Oh, there you yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say that that is an issue because, um, you know, a lot of the big problems are subsidized, uh, as we all know. And it's it's just like, why can't the small farming operations be um, supported uh, in a small way for doing the right thing for the planet and for the food system? Right. And I think you're exactly right. We need to find ways to help the small producers, uh, to help the folks who are doing, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts, um, who uh, who haven't always been part of the USDA family. They've been sort of off there on their own, um, but they're growing food. And I think, you know, we need to come up with some creative ways to, to address some of this stuff. That's great. Are there any other questions or comments before we close off? Sure. Thank you very much, everybody. Christine or, yes. or Dwayne, it's Caroline. Somebody in the chat box, Marilyn, asks if Dwayne oh. can put his contact information back up again. Are you able to do that, Dwayne? I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Let me put that back up. Uh, can we'll... you just put it in the chat box too, maybe? And then so they can they oh, can cut and be... paste it. That might be a little easier to cut and paste. Wouldn't and that I will... be easy? And I will and I will actually send out uh, Dwayne's contact information along with um, the recording because we record our sessions. So I will make sure that everybody has his contact information. I will put it right in now. noticed you kept all the politics out of your descriptions of the of things that have come through like <laughs> swamp buster and side buster i remember when <laughs> the governors had to opt in and uh <laughs> and when it took a cycle of every eight years to get onto csp and but it, anyway, it was good really good doing yeah nobody said this was going to be easy and it, <laughs> you know it's I, it's like farmers doing soil health practices it's not easy. This is really hard stuff that they're doing. And it's hard because it's change, but it's hard because there's a lot to learn and a lot to understand. And um, so I think, you know, we need to understand this. We're not, this is not the easy button that we're hitting here. This is really a smart button of moving us ahead to um, really focus agriculture around the health of our soils because healthy soils deliver healthy food, that delivers healthy people, delivers healthy water, healthy wildlife, a healthy climate, but it all goes back to soil. And especially with our changing climate too. Yeah. I mean, it's only gonna be more challenging. That is for sure. So. Thanks to you all. Yeah, thank you. Th thanks, Admiral Franken, for joining us, too. How fun to have you on. I hope you picked up some valuable information. And if you want to learn more, you're welcome to uh, join us anytime. It's great to see some friends out there. So yeah. thanks for Dwayne, being on. Thank you very much, Dwayne. It was really a good presentation. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. I took all kinds of screenshots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shameless. <laughs> it, it is recorded too. So yeah. 
All right, All everybody. Right. Have a great evening and yeah. a great Good week. night, everyone. Stay safe right. with the storms. Yes, yes, seriously. Right, Thanks. Be safe. You doing? Thanks. See you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Good seeing you. Bye-bye. Thank you again.